On Emerson by Father Leonardo Castellani, taken from the Critica Literaria, translated by Cotton Mather. Emerson is a minor English poet, but a good one. After all, who couldn't be a poet in English, that most barbarous and brief language in the universe, formed as it is of three-dimensional monosyllables, its grammar most flexible and demanding, a language polished to the most exquisite refinement by generations of writers who have religiously preserved its sacred deposit in uninterrupted and patient labor. Yes, Emerson's poems are good, and his essays are nothing but bad poems. The purity of that very English medium, fixed in an uninterrupted secular task from the time of Chaucer to the time of Chesterton, is muddied up by Emerson in his unsuccessful and nebulous attempts at German philosophy, and with those ridiculous witticisms which are so typical of Yankee practicality. A wandering and sharp-witted Yankee intellectual, Emerson made his living as a lecturer. This is to say that he traveled across half the earth giving paid conferences, something particularly agreeable to the Yankee mind. The material of these lectures then filled his essays, which appear to be vast intellectual diaries, abounding in ingenious phrases, poetic discoveries, and the vivid and picturesque impressions of his formidable attempts at thought, themselves tending towards a sort of prodigious sterility. Yes, it's useless to look for a systemization of his ideas that can even vaguely congeal and point towards some higher principle which is not merely subjective. What do you want me to say? He has not even common sense, that solid and stable foot-on-the-groundness which we have become accustomed to in Spanish literature and of which, in a special form, does not lack even in the most spiritualized of the English essayists, such as in De Quincey or in Hazlitt. This supremely proud and poorly educated Yankee doesn't even have a shadow of it, for which reason we can by no means count him to be a good teacher. The most charming of his are those occasionally surprising and nomic apothegmas, such as in that wonderfully decanted sentence of his that I don't even know what I would have given to have written myself. I like my poems best because it is not I who write them. Now, above all, what is of interest in Emerson is the reflection of the Yankee mentality, so precious to the history of culture, that curious mix of religiosity and decadence, of philosophical pantheism and the untamed boldness of the spoiled child, a mix of snobbishness and of practicality, of optimism and of empiricism, all topped off with a certain dominating effervescence of whiskey to complete the ensemble, the very same savor so characteristic of Walt Whitman, William James, and Mark Twain, and of which Poe, being the only genial and frustrated thinker North America has ever produced, was entirely free of. If Emerson is anything at all, he's a modernist in the religious sense of the term. This singular heresy, along with theosophy, is the last stage of the evolution of Protestantism, Born in England, spread to the Latin countries, and dealt a critical blow by Pius X, it has just now entered into the consciousness of the Hispanic world, and must now attract our attention, for it is the most subtle falsification of Christianity ever forged. Such as it lies in the encyclical Pascendi and in the anti-modernist oath, it appears as little else but a nebulous mound of the unbelievable and crude theological errors of old but such as it lives in the minds of Tyrell, Loasi, Fagazzaro, Bernard Shaw, Beresford, and Unamuno, it is terribly dangerous for unscrupulous Catholics, to whom it presents itself as Christian dogma in its integrity, tranquilly incensed and reverenced, to be sure, but emptied from within of all its supernatural content, and thus converted into a sort of great symbolic mythology for all that is divine in human nature. We believe that the last religious posture of Bergson, which some of the gullible have taken for Catholic, is simply the position of theological modernism. Gran artista, con los místicos creyente. Buen cristiano, mal católico apostólico romano. En el fondo teologal, naturalista russoiano. This is the benefit we've derived from our reading of Emerson, and we doubt if any other can be found. If in English he's already supremely indigestible for an Argentine, what will he be in a fragmentary translation? The Yankees have such a genial species of aptitude for cosmic absurdities, of the sort that Sarmiento liked, and which are now out of fashion, those which were so typical of Flammarion. Sarmiento was a president who read Flammarion in public, the rub being that he had a powerful voice, and so he Flammarionized Argentina, 
and with it all its normal school teachers for two generations. Sarmiento enjoyed the particular way the Yankees had of driving themselves mad. What he forgot was that in order to be a madman with impunity, one needed to have a great inheritance of sanity. And so Chesterton and Lucas could dance on top of a pin and make themselves angels. But as soon as Sarmiento and Emerson wished to fly, they naturally must crash to the earth like hogs in filth. And now what is to be said of Emerson's biographer, who appropriates a quarter of his work for his own personal rantings? According to the translator, he's a poet from Kansas by the name of Edgar Lee Masters, author of the Spoon River Anthology, a man who has written children's stories and works of a historical character. To us, he's little more than a colorful charlatan. He tells his own life in place of Emerson's, or so it seems, informing us that he and the other misfits at his high school suffocated in central Illinois under the weight of its parochial orthodoxy. But one day they came upon, and I quote, the stimulating doctrines of Emerson, which teaches that all of us are potential geniuses, ready to spread out our wings and fly if we lay our hands upon the springs of courage within us. In school, Emerson did this for two or three of us. Under his influence, we felt that we could not put ourselves on the margins of an honest life because we thought freely about religion or about anything else. Just as Emerson told an old theologian that he must follow his own way and that if he was a child of the devil that he must continue being one, we also had to conduct ourselves as children of the devil if such was our role in life. So we did, and we felt happy and strong doing so. Edgar Lee Masters goes on to ponder how behaving like the devil's child freed him from the, quote, cramping influence of the village, and later he confides that, quote, there were two other schoolmates who found themselves by way of Emerson, girls. One of them, under Emerson's influence, imagined herself to be a genius, which in this case was not true, thus of course modestly recognizing it to be true in his own case, as Mr. Edgar Lee Masters would seem to imply. Quote, her life could be taken as an example of the possible danger that Emerson can offer one. Now, evidently, it's more dangerous socially to want to become a devil before one's time for the girls. But the boys also have their danger. If they're careless, they'll become idiots. Mr. Edgar Lee Masters is one of those Yankees with checkered hats that I've seen all over Europe. Those waves of cheeky little fellows who go around spouting nonsense. All of them insolent and naive. Meddling in everything and speaking at inopportune times in the manner of spoiled children. Of them, a Neapolitan wisecrack once relayed to me this profundity. Quote, Listen, sir, the Americans are good, I agree, but they are not a serious people. <laughs>